Ready? And we'll open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you and praise you, Father God, for your presence here this morning. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would anoint the word as it leaves my lips, Father God, that you prepared the hearts and minds of those who are to receive the word of God today. Let it be engrafted into their hearts, transforming and changing them into the image of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, the title is, of course, Whose Influence Are We Being Shaped By? Or Whose Influence Are We Being Shaped? Series 3, Part 2. And thank you for reminding me, sweetheart, because I look, I look at it and I, what, which one was that? Because I didn't put the title up front. Uh, so welcome to People's Tabernacle Church and Bible Learning Center. We hope that you're enjoying this series. And if you'd wish to support the mission of this church, uh, it's People's Tabernacle Church dot at kojiko.net. There we go. <laughs> People's Tabernacle Church at Kojiko.net. And we thank you and praise you for that. Um, I've been putting, posting uh, on uh, SoundCloud. And uh, we've already got followers on SoundCloud listening to, to the messages. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's on both. So we closed off last time, if you remember, emphasizing the need for us to understand. Now, the need for us to understand as new creations in Christ, right? Are we new creations in Christ? All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In other words, then, we have to need to understand that we have no common to man liabilities, no common to man liabilities. I'll explain as we go. Yes. Now, the best way to sum this up is to say the words of Jesus. And Jesus said, he has nothing in me. Who's he talking about? The devil. So turn with me and we'll look at it. If you will turn with me, and you did, of course, to John 14, 30. At uh, the bottom end of the, of the verse, yes. <laughs> I will not talk with you much more, for the prince, the evil genius, ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. And he has no power over me. Absolutely, David. I was just about to say, if, he's, if this is what Jesus is saying, we have to understand the words that Jesus is saying. And because we are in him, he has the, no power over you and I at all. It's only by default. It's only by not knowing, not learning, not understanding who we are, whose we are, and what we are in Christ that he still has entrance. But the entrance has been shut. By Christ. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully to this. Most believers, biblical correct words, actually pass through their persuasion. I am fully persuaded that neither death nor height nor left, da, 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 passes through their persuasion in so much that they believe that they do have common to man liabilities. Mortal, ceremonial, and moral liabilities. Our moral connections to the old man inhabit the necessary... We have these connections, sorry, because we do not possess the necessary humility needed to, co to correctly expedite the removal of the mortal, moral, and ceremonial liabilities to Adam and the flesh. See, I haven't read my Bible. I haven't gone to church in months. Listen, what does that have to do with the finished work of Jesus Christ? Does he, did he, need yours and my help in finishing his work? Thank God he didn't. <laughs> I 
Now listen, Jesus didn't finish the work given to him by Father God in order for us to complete it with our isms. See that? Or our systems of philosophy. That's right. So look with me if you will now. Go to Romans chapter 7 and verse 22. I want you to notice how this verse starts. Notice how this verse starts. Paul is writing to the Romans, correct? Is Paul who's writing this letter? Yes. He says, I endorse and delight in the law of God. Now, can anybody tell me what the law of God is? The law of perfect liberty. The law of perfect liberty, right? He said, I endorse and delight in the law of God in my outposts. In my innermost self. And in the amplified in brackets, it's got with my new nature. See that? And verse 23. But I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the, and will of the flesh, a different law or rule of action, a war against the law of my mind, my reason, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. Have you got sensitive wills and appetites of the flesh? Still? Oh, that chocolate looks good. <laughs> I'm still waging a war against chocolate. These two verses of Scripture pin pinpoint, if you will, where most Christians are today in their walk with God. Looking then at verse 22, I delight in the law of God. Now, please understand this is not the Mosaic law, no. not the Levitical law. This is referring to the law of the spirit of life and the perfect law of liberty. The law, if you will, of Father God. Not the law of Moses. So what Paul is saying here is that I delight in the law of God according to my inward man. See, and our inward man has to become master of our outward man, of the flesh. Remember, if you will, that we have established that the effective communication requires that the spirit man and the natural man to connect to the same sounds with the same ideas. You remember that? Remember, we also established that the spirit of, of man, the spirit of man is of God. That's where it comes from. Period. Yes, you're right. And because he, the spirit man, is of God, that he has no sense of obligation. The spirit man. He agrees with exemption. We have been exempted from the law. He agrees with liberty. The things then that we are reading, the scriptures that we are reading, he, the spirit man, already agrees with. If you are having any difficulty at all agreeing with the scriptures that we have just read, know for a fact that it's not your spirit man. It might be your intellect, it might be your flesh, but it's not your spirit man. The spirit man knows that inside, because he's of God, he knows. And he's in agreement because he's of God. Why? Because he's a new creation. A brand new creation. All things indeed have passed away. 
all things have become new to him. And all things are of God the Father. He knows that. Hmm. Hallelujah. You know, the more we study this, the more we understudy, we'll study the rhema and the logos of the word of God, the more we understand its, what shall I say, its, its home within us. In that every cell in your body and every cell in my body is filled with the word. And because it is filled with the word, it has the ability to replace itself. It has the ability of repair and adjustment. That's why we're still here today. However many years you've been on the earth, right? You know, it's not like a, a seasonal plant. You plant the seed and it's good for one season, right, Jamie? And then poof, it dies, withers and dies. It, it ceases to be. But you and I, our physical bodies, never, I'm not talking about our spirit because our spirits are immortal, but our physical bodies have within them, in every cell, I wish I could conjure up, not conjure up, I wish I could bring that video back that I had uh, of a cell reproducing itself. How these little nanobots would go down the double helix and they'd pick out certain parts. They know exactly where to go. And they pick out certain parts and they put it on what I call a, a, a barcode rack, right? And then that barcode rack would go into this chamber and it would be made into, um, what do they call them? Anyway, it was part of a, of a cell so that the cell could reproduce itself. And this is happening in every one of our cells, and there are millions of them in our body, and it's happening as we sit here at this moment in time. Our body has the ability to repair and adjust. Right? You see, what we have come to understand is what it has to say about this. What we need to understand, I should say, is what it has to say about this in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, we're going to look at verses 17 through 24. But you see, the one thing we, we, we have to understand about the flesh and this ability to repair and adjust, right, is that this came about at the fall. You see, Adam, when he was first created, and Adam, the man with the womb, when they were first created, their bodies were to last forever. They were not going to grow old. They were not going to die. They were going to live forever. But when they fell, decay, death set in. It took a number of years for it to happen, like it does with you and I, right? But it comes to every man and every woman at some point in time. So they were meant to live forever. They weren't meant to, to die or grow old or age. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Apparently that's what our new body is going to be like. Amen? So Genesis 5. Uh, Galatians, not Genesis. I'm looking at Galatians and saying Genesis. Hallelujah. I was back there with Adam. Sorry. <laughs> now, for the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Spirit or to the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the flesh are opposed, and the desires of the spirit, sorry, are opposed to the flesh, godless, the godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other, continually with, withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free, but prevented from doing what you desire to do. But if you are guided and led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the doings or practices of the flesh are clear and obvious. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, 
idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, ill temper, selfishness, divisions, <sighs> dissensions, <laughs> party spirit, factions, sects and particular opinions, heresies, envy, drunkenness, goodness, miss it. the list goes on and on, <laughs> carousing and the like. <laughs> Yeah, eating chocolate. <laughs> I warn you beforehand. You know, I can't take two chocolate biscuits. I've got to take six. <laughs> Just because they're covered in chocolate. I warn you beforehand. Put the jar away. Just as I did previously, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the works which His presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, continence. Against such things there is no law that can bring a charge. And those who belong to Jesus Christ the Messiah have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature with its passions and appetites and desires. In essence, then, <laughs> this is what we've just read. I delight in the law of God, the law of liberty, and the law of the spirit of life, according to the inward man. Then we see that Paul is also saying, I see another law. I see another law. Romans 7.23. He said, I see another law in my members. And this word members here literally means limbs and body parts. So in Romans 7, 23, reads, But I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, a different law, or rule of action, at war against the law of my mind, my reason, and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. So what Paul is saying here is that the law of the ceremonial and mortal liability wars against the liberty of God. Have you ever experienced any of that? And what Paul is saying also is that it's making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, in my members. Then I, I see the tangible proof. What then is the tangible proof? The tangible proof is disease, stress, and lack. Parkinson's has now been attributed to a life of stress. It is, is a stress disease with double A personalities. <laughs> There's a healing in just relieving people of stress. Stress is one of the biggest killers of today's world. So what we have then is a classic case of not connecting the same sounds with the same ideas. Think on that. The sound of redemption isn't communicating the sound of exemption. The sound of redemption isn't communicating the sound of exemption. 
Well, we talk and sing about being redeemed. And then we still leave the church on Sunday morning still feeling fully obligated, fully stressed, morally and ceremonially. Forgetting that we have been set free by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. See, we don't fully understand yet the redemption and exemption. And because we don't understand, fully understand yet the, re, the redemption and the exemption, it means that we don't fully understand the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because he set us free. But we've, and like Paul is saying here, I've still got this war going on in the members of my flesh. The dictates and the desires and the wills of the flesh. Chocolate. I'm going to put that away. Well, I'll find it. I just got to overcome it. <laughs> I've got a victory over it, right? Right? I'm good on some days, and other days I'm not. <laughs> Remember, if you will, <laughs> I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded. I'm not fully persuaded yet, so I'm still battling. I am persuaded, listen, through which I speak. To know and not to do is really not yet to know. When I know, it comes through my persuasion, passes over my lips, and changes things. Now turn we, with me now, if you will, to Genesis 5.1. Pardon? Yes. But we don't have full depth and the full concept of understanding the problem. You know, the problem is there. It's there on the surface but we've got to get to the root, right? Galatians 5.1. No, Galatians 5.1. If I said Genesis, I'm sorry, it's Galatians. And what is this with Galatians? Galatians is coming out Genesis. I wonder if Genesis will come out Galatians. <laughs> so remember, I am persuaded through which I speak. Are you saved? Well, I don't know. Right? They're not fully persuaded through which they speak. If they were fully persuaded to say, yes, I am. I'm crucified with Christ. So Galatians 5.1. In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then, and do not be hampered and held ensnared and submit again to the chocolate, I mean to a yoke of slavery which you once put off. <laughs> Stand fast therefore in the freedom from the moral ceremonial and mortal exemption by which Christ has made us exempt. Christ has made us exempt. All of this body of Christ is with regard to the abundant life provided for us by redemption, refurbishment, and recovery through Christ's finished work on the cross. Jesus then fulfilled all of the obligation, releasing us from the obligation of sin separation. That's the moral obligation, right? Thus releasing us from the ceremonial Releasing us from the curse. That's the mortal liberty. See it? Now, if you will, go with me now, just down the road a bit, to Galatians 5.13. 
For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. But through love, you should serve one another. We've been called to freedom then, right? We've been called to freedom. We then have been called to a zero obligation. To a non-resistant liberty in Christ. And that's not to say, of course, that we don't have any obligation to one another, because we do. But through love, we serve one another. Listen then. The only obligation that we have is to one another. The only obligation that we have is to one another, because through love, you serve one another. Jesus through his love for his Father, served you and I selflessly, selflessly, and flawlessly. See that? Everyone, yes. Saved or unsaved, you got it, David, yeah. Amen. So we have no ceremonial obligation any longer. So this then is a God-given obligation. Jesus served us all through love. Even taking him up to and including the cross. With the purest Love imaginable. What is God? Love. God is love. So that with and in regard to relationship and of the exchange of benefits regarding ourselves and the finished work of Jesus Christ, we have no moral obligation or liability or ceremonial obligation anymore through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, it's good that we receive communion and to be anointed with oil. But if these things just become ceremonial exercises, they just won't work. They just won't work, right? Turn with me now, please, to John Five, and we'll look at verses 26 six through 27. It's John 5, 26 to 27. And then we're going to switch up gears. So we've established, I hope, that we've been set free. Yes, indeed. Some ceremonial, mortal, and moral liabilities. He whom the Son of God has set free is free, is free indeed. And that's what it means. And this is a, a scripture that we need to ingest. For even as the Father has life in himself and his self-existence, so he has given to the Son to have life within himself and be self-existent. Who's got self-existence? Who oh, else? The Son. And he has given him authority and granted him power to execute, to exercise, to practice judgment because he is a son of man. Very man. In other words, he's human. See that? So he has life in and of himself, but the Father has given him the authority and granted him the power to execute and to exercise and practice judgment. 
So I hope that we're able to see in the scriptures that we've been reading so far that Jesus associated himself with all humanity, saved and unsaved. Yes. Yes. For he became what? Flesh. Now, I hope that we can see that his flesh was the same as ours. Jesus, as we know, continuously referred to himself as the Son of Man. And of course, to his being the Son of God. Now, don't throw eggs at me. But what we have done through religion is that we've capitalized, listen, the word man within the phrase son of man. Inadvertently, what we've done in doing this is that we've minimized, listen, minimizing the intention of the Father in his showing us just who we are as his children, his offspring, his sons and daughters. So we see Son of Man in the Scriptures, and we know that he's referring to Jesus because it's capitalized. Right? And in our capitalizing the Son part of it, we've lost touch with the true meaning of Jesus. What Jesus is doing in saying that he is the Son of God, listen, is that he was trying to show us that we are all sons of God, or we are all God's sons of man. We're all, as men, we're all sons of God. That we haven't lost our identity in God, but what we've done since the fall is losing the likeness of God in the fall. But we never stop being sons of God. Estranged? We became estranged? And when we became estranged, we became so unlike God, becoming lost and immersed in the flesh, losing the righteousness and holiness of God. Listen, but not losing the image of God. We never lost the image, we lost the likeness. We became unlike God by becoming centered on self, selfish, demanding, arrogant, and unloving. We need to see here, what we need to see here is that as sons of God, we still have the life of God in us. How can we say that, body of Christ? How can we say we still have the life of God in us? How can that unsafe person out there in the world have the life of God in them? Well, as, as Marion just said, thank you, Marion. <laughs> Jesus filled all things everywhere with himself. Now, what did you say, David? We all have the inner man, the spirit. But, but what did we just talk about that, in, that is in every cell of our body? The logos, the rhema, is in every cell of our body, whether we're saved or unsaved. Right? So everybody out there is walking around with God in them, yes. with the Lord in them, with Jesus in them. I hope that we can see this. 
The very breath we breathe is the life of God. Lose the breath of life and we cease to be. Turn with now for the last scripture for today. We're going to go back to John 5. Are you still there? We're going to remind ourselves of a scripture we just read. Now that we know that, now that we've just, excuse me, we have the, uh, the image of God. We're still in the image of God, right? But now that we're born again or received the knowledge of Christ within us and the spirit within us has come alive once again unto God and is in union once again with God, what do we have? Can anybody tell me what we have? We have communion. New creation. We now again have the image of and the likeness of God. Right? We had the image, but we lost the likeness. We were unlike God in the fallen state. But now that we're brand new creations, we are restored and returned to the image and likeness of God. See it? So let's read this again with that knowledge in mind. John 5, 6. 26. For even as the Father has life in himself and his self-existence, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself and be self-existent. Are you a son of God? Yes. So what's that saying, body of Christ? We have life and we are self-existent because we are sons of God. Sons, daughters of God. There's no, no sex is in the spirit. And 27 goes on to say, and he has given him authority and granted him power to execute, exercise, practice judgment because he is a son of man, very man. See, you are a son of man. You're a son of God. You're a son of the man, Jesus, the last Adam. And we have to work. You, you've been listening to my, I haven't done it yet, but navigators. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm covering that in navigators in one of, the, one of the two. So what we have to understand, by your Christ, we're brand new creations. The old has passed away. Yeah. I mean, I wish we could get rid of it. But like Pastor Helen would say, we keep going down the garden and pulling the cat's tail and taking it out of the ground again. Examining, looking at it, it stinks. Leave it. Let it be buried. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It isn't coming. It has come. And that's what we have to renew our minds to, that we are new creations all together. Yes. And we have become one with Christ. We are in him and one with him. And we are seated with him in the heavenly, super, in the heavenly places, in the heavenly supernatural sphere. He is seated at the right hand side of God on a throne. At the right hand side of God. He's not sitting on a bar stool. Or anything resembling that. He's sitting on a throne beside his father. And we are seated in him and with him. Amen. So the father has given us life in and of ourselves. Because you're going to live forever. See it? If you're going to live forever, you're self-existent. See, you're always going to be you. You may have a new body in heaven. But she's always going to be you. I'm not going to become you, and you're not going to become me. We're going to be ourselves. See that? I hope you do. 
What Jesus is expressing here is that as the sons of God, if you can't grasp that self-existent bit, Jesus is expressing here that we as the sons of God, we have the re- very life of God in us. Is he self-existent? We have the genetic imprint of God within us. Where there is life in all things, you will find the imprint of God. Doesn't matter what you're looking at. With the life-giving Holy Spirit within. Now, in the new world of physics, I'm going to close with this and give you this to think about. Have you heard of that accelerator in, uh, in Europe somewhere? Um, yes. They've got a particle accelerator. Yes. And they're getting particles to crash into one another. Yeah. Right? And what they've come up with, they've come up with a, a mysterious element And this mysterious element is in all things. <laughs> and they called it the Higgs bison particle. The Higgs bison particle. Because Higgs bison was the one who discovered it. So they called it after him. But it's the very essence of life itself. So what do we call it? What have we called it for for months and months? Years. What do we call tiny particles of God? A pharaoh. A pharaoh. They should have they should have come and asked us. <laughs> you see that? So what we want to establish, what we need to understand and what we need to see is we are no longer tied, have any connection to the old man. In the new man, with the new creation, we are exempt. It no longer applies to us. Now as we grasp that, as we get to understand that, sickness and disease will have no place it will have no entrance because we'll understand more and more and more what the Higgs bison particle is. <laughs> right? Can you see that? Is it beginning to gel? Is it beginning to form? Is it beginning to reveal itself and show itself? We have no obligation at all to the moral ceremonial or mortal obligations of the fall or man anymore. We are in this world, but we are no longer of it. Well, because we don't understand. We don't understand who we are, who we are, and what we are. That's what this is all about. We aren't there. We're still... You know, I, we got one foot in the grave. Is that, is there a song? Uh, something like that, got one foot in the grave. You know, we, we, we're still, still, still weighed down with our ceremonial, right, moral and mortal obligations to Adam, the fall, and the flesh. They're done. They're gone. We're now new creations in Christ, in God. That's the beauty of it. People are worried that mankind excludes them. Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. A woman was making speech that mankind. Yeah. 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 Well, hallelujah. How can we ever? How can we? How can we indeed? Well, you see, <laughs> people have got to hear this. This has got to go out into the world. You know, and, and possibly, I hate to say this, but possibly 
the world will, will be more understanding and more accepting than the church. Because of the religiosity that is, that is keeping them keeping them down. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you get something from that? Yes. Good, eh? Let's pray. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, Father God, for this day, for your blessings, for your provisions, and Lord, that all that you have provided for us in and through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Help us, O Holy Spirit, to understand more and more the freedom, the perfect law of liberty that we now live in and under, because Christ has set us free. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the word that went forth that we will not lose any of what we've heard today. And we give you praise for it now and thank you for it in Jesus' mighty master's name. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Amen.